All right, guys. So I'm going to tell you beforehand, I got a timer ready because we are off track and we're going to get back on track this evening. So open up your Bibles as quickly as you can to Job. We are going to do chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Wow. You're going to witness a miracle tonight, okay? Next week, we're going to do chapter 8. Here's, here's the main reason why. We're going to go through some discourses here. It's really hard, I guess I my timer, it's really hard when it comes to a discourse to break it up. I mean, there's some times where we can break up and say, okay, let's do a recap. But really, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 are all one sort of dialogue. And if we break that up, it's going to get really complicated over the weeks to come. The other part of that is, remember, we're going to take summer break like usual. Right now, summer is getting shorter and shorter, okay? So um, so if you want to open up your Bibles, everybody there? Oh, man, good students. All right. So the first two chapters, again, sort of set the stage for us. There is this contest or this conflict, this contention um, in the spiritual realm. And remember, Job has no idea what's going on in the spiritual realm there's these accusations that Satan is giving. He's slandering not just God, but he's slandering Job at the same time. And remember, he goes to God and he says, hey, God. And God says, hey, what are you doing? What have you been doing? And he's, he's kind of prompting Satan there. He says, well, have you, you know, I've been going back and forth. And he says, have you considered Job? None of us ever want to hear that, right? Have you considered, insert your name? He says, man, he's upright. He fears me. He shuns all evil. And Satan says, yeah, I have, actually. I've been checking him out. Here's the thing. He would would turn against you, you know, in an instant if you just took away all these things that he has. If you let me touch his life. And so God says, hey, I don't, it's not going to happen. And remember, Job doesn't know this contest that's going on, right? And it's not much of a contest because you and God are always a majority. Always, right? It's not a fair fight, right? It's. It's the, I was going to use a Rocky thing, but we all know it's the same movie. So it, it's like, Mike, it is the same movie, okay? It, it is that sort of contest where you have, you know, somebody who just cannot fight against somebody who is the complete supreme one. You know, you always, you always know they're going to win. And so God allows Satan to be able to touch his life. Satan, remember, doesn't, doesn't pull any punches. He takes his, all 10 of his kids. He takes all of his livestock. He takes all of his workers, except for the workers that have come to tell him that he has nothing left. In the end, he leaves nothing other than who? His wife. And the one advice that she has, she says, hey, honey, I love you, but why don't you just curse God and die? He says, man, this is why I married you, sweetheart. Thank you for that word of advice. But throughout that, Job is still blameless in the sight that he's mature, right? He's full of integrity still. So Satan goes back to God, and God says, hey, what's on your mind? He says, hey, here's the thing. Of course he still worships you, but he curses you to your face if you let me touch him. He says, okay, you can do that, just don't take his life. And remember, the last week we ended with Job, he's got boils, and they're not just regular boils, whatever the case they are, they're painful boils, right? As if a boil is not bad enough. It's a painful boil. They're from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. He's scraping them with pottery. He's outside the house where the sick and the dying and the dogs would be in the dumpsters, rubbing trash and ash on his sores. His three friends, who we're, we're going to find out later, are older and wise or sort of like sages. They come out to him, and they don't know what to say. They're heartbroken. They're thinking, is this really Job? Remember, it said that he was the greatest man in the East. How can this be Job? And they sit with him for seven days. Nobody knows what to say. And finally, Job breathes. I remember what he starts off. He says, man, I wish I was never conceived. And it's an awkward moment because these three guys have been sitting. And again, it starts off. They are such good friends, right? They're not trying to counsel him. They're not trying to figure out what's going on. They sit with him. Their heart is broken because this guy that they love, his life is shattered. And he's broken emotionally and now physically and spiritually, and they're broken. And he says, I wish I was never conceived. Then he goes on to say, I wish that when I was born, I would have died as an infant. And then we ended last week, right? Super encouraging. 
where he ended and he said, I wish I was just, I wish God would just take my life. What's the point of living if this is all there is to living? Lord, please take my life. And up until this point, his three friends, again, they're heartbroken. They're filthy with him. They smell with him. They've been sitting there for seven days. Chapter four now, Job finishes his first set of dumping out his fullness of heart. And remember, as we walk through this, just because it's in the Word, right, it's given us insight into Job. There, for the most part, all, everything that Job is going to say is real. Right? He's not going to curse God throughout this, but he's being very real and very open. It doesn't mean we set our doctrines by this, right? I mean, there are some things, I mean, you can take somebody, you can take anybody as an example. I'm going to live my life like Judas. No, right? I've never dedicated a Judas or a Jezebel, ever. People understand that. But Job is being very real here. He has his first friend, um, Eliphaz, begins to speak. And we get the, get the sense that these guys are older. Um, and I'll just read you a couple different sections. Chapter 15, if you want to skip over there, and I'll just read you these. Chapter 15, verse 10, uh, it says that they were both, the gray-haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. Again, speaking about themselves. Chapter 32 he says this in verse, in verse 6. And Elihu, again, he, speaking of all these people, he says, I am young in years, and you are very old. Therefore, I was afraid and dare not declare my opinion to you. So we have these three sort of older sage men that are coming. And we get, I mean, he's a Timonite, so they're known for their wisdom. There is something that they come. They're older than Job's fathers. They're these wise men. They show up. They have great respect. They're regarded by men. Job has poured out his heart here in this brokenness. In chapter 4 and chapter 5, Eliphaz will respond, and then we'll have Job responding in the next two chapters. So, um, and again, I would, I would love, I, I think it's possible, to get through all of this this evening. So, chapter 4 says, Then Eliphaz the Timonite answered and said, If one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? So again, you know, if we want to respond now, you know, in the sense is we've talked this stuff over, right? They've made some sort of journey, these three guys. They said, we've talked this over. We don't know if you're ready to hear it, but we really want to give you our advice on these things. Um, and this is where the problem starts because they're going to start giving advice and they're going to start going by their own experience instead of by what the word says. At the very end of this, God is going to speak to Eliphaz. He's going to say, hey, Eliphaz, uh, I need you to go to Job, and I need you to talk to him. He's going to make a sacrifice for you. He's going to show you how to make a sacrifice because your idea of who I am, your revelation of who I am, is so wrong, it's unreal. Now, they seem very spiritual. They seem like they, they want to help. But he's saying, hey, are you going to be able to hear this? Verse 3, surely you have instructed many. They're speaking to Job, hey, you're a wise man. And you have strengthened weak hands, and your words have upheld him who was stumbling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. Here's what they're saying. Hey, physician, heal yourself. And everybody loves to hear that, right? Like, man, you're so strong, and you give people lots of wisdom. So what's the problem? You tell people, you know, trust in God. So what's the problem here? How come you can't do this? And again, they started off by sort of, they're going to start off here by sort of buttering him up a little bit before they kind of roast him on the fire is, is kind of the idea here. They're going to say, man, you're super wise. You know, man, you give the best advice, but how come you're not taking your own advice? And remember, these are real people in real time. They're in the outside of the city in the dump. Job is not sleeping. He's not eating. He's overwhelmed. His, his heart is overwhelmed. And these guys come to him, and they think they have a general knowledge of God, but again, not a biblical correctness in their opinion. So now he begins to accuse him in verse 5. It says, but now it comes upon you, and you are weary. It touches you, and you are troubled. Is it not your reverence, your, is it not your reverence, your confidence, and your integrity of your ways, hope? Remember now, whoever perished being innocent. Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen these who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the shame. So 
they have this premise, and here's their premise throughout this whole dialogue, because we're going to see they're going to give one dialogue, Job's going to answer each one of them, then we're going to go a little bit farther, and then it's going to start all over again. They're going to go, no, no, Job, you've got it all wrong. And here's their premise. Good things and blessings will happen to godly people. Bad things and curses or harsh things happen to people that are sinful and wicked. Now, I'm going to assume that we all know that's phony baloney, right? I mean, some of the stuff being under the spout where the blessings come out, blab and grab, name and claim. I mean, all that sort of thing, the big hair, gold chair. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, it, it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense for the Lord. Jesus said, man, if they've hated and despised me, they will what, church? Bless you and give you money. Is that what it says? No. They will hate and despise you. Their idea of God's judgment is all wrong. Their thought is God is just dealing with you, dude. God is dealing with you, and you need to maybe start examining your life because you've given wisdom to a lot of people. You need to examine this. Um, they're going to say, hey, the innocent have never suffered. Well, that doesn't make sense, right? The first real story we have of suffering is who? Abel. Was he innocent? Absolutely. And we could go through. Joseph. You know, we could go through, again, Asaph, Psalm Psalm 73, and I'm probably going to bring that up until we get through Job in five years, right? But he, he walks through, as he wrestles th with that same sort of thing, he's like, how can the wicked prosper? And it wasn't, again, until he went into the temple, until he saw the Lord, where all these sort of things were, were settled when attorney was before his eyes. So these guys are faithful, they just have the wrong perspective. And remember, the point of this book is not to answer the, the why, but it's to answer the who. It's not an explanation, but it's a revelation. And Job is going to get that revelation. These guys are not. And at the very end, God's going to say, go to Job, and he's going to give you the understanding of this revelation. Because it's very real to him right now. And emotionally, he probably doesn't want to hear this, right? You ever been so tired and somebody tells you something that you know is wrong, but then you start rethinking, well, maybe it's, maybe it's right. It starts playing tricks. They're going to go through this dialogue. Verse 9, by the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, and the teeth of the young lions are broken. So, Job, you were once so strong, um, which again, everybody loves to hear that when you're being broken, right? Man, you were once so strong. What happened to you? I always think about that when my kids look at pictures when we were younger. They're like, what happened? You, that's what happened. Uh, <laughs> verse 9, it says, the old lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. So, again, I'm sure he totally loves this encouragement by Eliphaz. Now, he's going to reinforce his argument by saying this, I'm a spiritual person, and I've had this spiritual experience. And here's a problem many times where we get ourselves in trouble, where we see or we experience something that is outside of this, but because we've gone through it, it must be it must be fine, right? You, I could say to you, hey, the, the speed limit is set at 65. And you can say, well, I drove here at 90. That's your experience. Keep with that experience long enough, and you are going to get pulled over, right? Now, it might take a while, right? We're bitter rooters. I know you people. I see you pass by me, and then you look at me, and you're like, oh, no, did he see us? So I, I see it, okay? And yes, I'm praying for you. But um, they're going to say, hey, I've got this experience. And notice what they say. You can almost write a book about how exacting this is with the sort of, you know, the prosperity gospel that has come through the church. And, you know, when I first got saved in the late 90s, it was a huge thing. and It kind of died out and now it's sort of picking back up again. But you can almost hear it. Listen to what he says. Now, word was secretly brought to me. This is a secret thing. So pull in, Job. I, I want to share this with you. And my ear received a whisper to it. It disquieted thoughts from the visions of the night when a deep sleep falls on men. Fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones shake. Hey, it overwhelmed me. That's how I know this is true. I felt overwhelmed. A spirit passed before my face, and the hair on my body stood up. Did you hear what he just said? I got spiritual goosebumps, so this has to be true, okay? I got Holy Spirit goosebumps, so this has to be true. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. The form was before my eyes. There was silence. 
Then I heard a voice saying, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? If he puts no trust in his servants and if he charges his angels with error. And all throughout this, we're going to see there's, there's some twisting of the truth here. So we know who's behind the spirit. How much more those who dwell in the houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before a moth, they are broken in pieces from morning till evening, they perish forever with no one regarding. He said, man, that's, this is not an encouraging spirit, right? This is the spirit of Christmas uh, future. That's, that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, take you to your own grave site. Um, he says, I perceive this, and so it must be true. He said, I was in the night, I had this dream. I remember, it was, so it was two years ago, and we were, we were going to Nepal, last time we went to Nepal. And so we did Sunday service, said, hey, be praying for us. A bunch of us are going for a few weeks. And somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, why don't you let me know? I had a dream about you last night. And I said, oh, okay. And they said, it's from the Lord. And that always makes me go, okay, what is it? Because I want to be perceiving, right? I want to be able to hear, but I want to perceive. And they said, oh, you're not going to like it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Thanks. So I, they said, you should sit down. So I sat down. So I had a dream. And I'm not going to say it's prophecy, but it's from the Lord. Um, and I did not feel super built up right now, right? I mean, because that's what prophecy is supposed to do. It's supposed to encourage and build you up. And they say, here's the thing. I had a dream last night that you guys all got on the plane, and it crashed, and it crashed in the water, and then you all drowned, and you were there, and you were trying to save people, but then you were just, you all drowned. And some of you were on fire drowning. And I was like, oh, uh, thanks. That's more, you know, and I did. I asked. I said, what, what did you eat last night? Like, is this a pepperoni prophecy? Or is, it like, is, this, is this a real thing? Here's the thing. I knew. I knew. I was like, no. I, I mean, if that's how the Lord wants to take me home, I'm fine, right? In a fiery chariot. I'm okay with that. But I got to the airport, and I was like, no, I mean, we're, I know God has called us here. We're sitting in the little pad waiting to get on the plane. I start looking around. I'm thinking, is this a group of people that God is ready to take home right now? I start looking. And so this guy comes and he says, hey, I've had this experience. He says, the spirit came and fear, fear fell upon me. Now, that's not a good fear that he's talking about. He said, I was shaking in my boots and there was goosebumps and I was overwhelmed. This is not the Lord, right? Because fear of the Lord is clean, we're told. It's good. You know, 300, there's 365 fear knots in the Bible, one for every day of the year. And he says, but I was overwhelmed. His spiritual barometer is the fact that he got goosebumps. And so he says, hey, here's what the Spirit said to me. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Absolutely. That makes sense. Can a man be more pure than than his maker. What he's starting off with is true. But again, what he's going to say here is kind of one of those Judas moments that, again, remember when, when the woman comes and she pours oil on Jesus' feet and Judas says, hey, what are you doing? That money could have been sold and given to the poor. And the rest of the disciples are like, yeah. And Jesus says, stop, guys. Are you kidding me? That's a rough translation. Stop, okay? And then John tells us Judas did this because he was the money carrier and he wanted the money. It seemed super spiritual at the moment. And this guy comes and he says, hey, I'm, I'm this prophet. The Lord gave me this dream, you, you know, and again, it's counter to everything that Job would know. Always good to trust what you know for a fact, especially when somebody well-meaning gives you a word that you know is not from the Lord. You know, there's, there's that one story of the young prophet God gives to go give a message to the king. He gives a message to the king. He says, give that message. He comes straight back home. He goes, he gives a message. Older prophet hears that there's a younger prophet there. There's sort of prophet envy, right? So he goes back and he says, hey, why don't you come have dinner? He says, no, the Lord told me I got to go straight home. He said, oh, yeah, the Lord told me you're supposed to have dinner with me. And then halfway through the meal, remember the older prophet starts weeping. He's like, man, you're going to die. And he's like, what? What happened? What'd you put in the food? And he goes, no, like uh, God just told me you weren't supposed to be here. And now a lion's going to come and kill you on the way home. It's always what happens, right? Satan finds his way in there, rips us apart. But notice what he says here in verse 18. He says, if he puts no trust in his servants. Now, what did God say at the very beginning? Have you considered my servant Job? God has complete confidence in Job. 
So he's already starting to twist that. Not only that, he says, if he charges his angels with error, like, so is there, there's a voice behind this guy saying, hey, there's something that's been spoken here. Um, all of these sort of fallen ones that are there. He makes this sort of connection. He says, I've had this feeling. And then verse 21, I, I, I love this part because he says this. He says, does not their own excellence go away? They die even without wisdom. And Job's thinking, wow, my wife said what you just said, but way faster, right? And he's over, and there should be something in you and I where we stand for the truth. And it doesn't, it's not a matter of how long you've been in the Lord or how much knowledge you have, but standing for the truth regardless. One of the first times, I mean, I was a baby Christian, right? And I, I joke about it, but I was serious. I was still pasaming and jobbing, right? I didn't know the difference of any of this. And we were at this church, and I love this church. It's an all-Hawaiian church. Everything was in Hawaiian. And, uh, and I remember some guy got up, and he started teaching, and it was on how angels wanted us to only speak to them because God was super busy. So if we only spoke to them, and then they would talk to God for us, and in fact, if we just worshiped them, then they would say, give that worship. And I was like, this doesn't seem right to me. And I went and talked to the pastor. And he said, oh, you don't know who this guy is? He got a doctorate, and he's got all these pieces of paper on his wall that you and I can't even spell or pronounce. And, and I went home, and I, I got out of concordance. You guys remember books? Remember those? And I got out of concordance, and I went through, you know, who should we be worshiping? What does that look like? And angels. And every time somebody bows down an angel, they go, whoa, no, 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 no. You don't do that. That's not how this works. And I brought it back, and I remember having to leave that church because of that. Because the pastor didn't want it. He said, well, this guy's got a doctorate. How do we know that what he's saying is not true? <laughs> because <laughs> God told us it's not true. And again, at the time, I, I, was, I was like quoting, I was like, yeah, first Quranicals, you know, again, hey, homeschooler. No, I'm just kidding. I was a public school kid. I had... I'm just kidding. I read Dr. Zeus books every single year. So, all right, chapter five. Oh, my goodness. Call out now. Is there any who will answer you to which the holy ones, to which of the holy ones will you turn? So, hey, what direction are you going to move, Job? Are you going to listen to what we say? For wrath kills a foolish man and envy slays a simple one. So, again, imagine this. What he's saying here is, hey, we're wise. This is your fault. You're here because this is your fault. I have seen the foolish taking root, and suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far off from safety. They are crushed at the gate, and there is no deliverer. So again, imagine how that sounds to Job. Now, here's the part of this that kills me here. Do you remember how Job's kids were killed? The walls came in on the house, right? They were crushed. So what does Eliphaz say to him? He says, hey, here's the thing. God's judging you. God crushes people that he's judging. Now, what is that going to do to a father's heart? And maybe Eliphaz thought of that. Maybe he didn't. Either way, he's not being very kind with his words. And we sort of see this diversion here. And I think Eliphaz thought that he was doing what was right. Absolutely. I, thought, I think he was, thought he was doing what was right. But he's, he's going by his, his own thoughts. Because he hungry, eat up the, for, the harvest, verse 5, taking it even to the thorns. And the snare snatches their substance. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Hey, Job, it's not like a weed, right? Your trouble is growing because of your own life. Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. But as for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause. Hey, I would search out these things, Job, because you've got some major issues, and I think we all know it. Who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number? He gives rain on the earth and sends water in the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted up to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. Um, he's insinuating something here. He's saying, hey, God can't get to you any other way, so he's going to break you here. He catches the wise, verse 13, in their own craftiness. And the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them, and they meet in the darkness of, in the daytime, and they grope at noontime as in night. But he saves the needy from the sword and from the mouth of the mighty and from their hand. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts 
their mouth. So um, now by verse 17, um, it seems like, you know, he's going to try to comfort him a little bit. Behold, consider this. Happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. Now that is true, but not in the context that he's saying this, right? It says, for he bruises and he binds up, he wounds and his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, and seven, no evil shall touch you. And you shall, in famine, he shall redeem you from death and in war from power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the scourge of the tongue and shall not be afraid of the destruction when it comes. And you shall laugh at destruction and famine. Then you shall not be afraid of the beast of the earth. You shall have a covenant with the stones of the field. Again, the stones were the things that were pulled out of there. So he's saying there's not going to be any reaping or sowing of these things. are going to be pushed off to the side. And the beast of the field shall be peace with you, and you shall know that your tent is in peace, and you shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. You shall know that your descendants shall be many, and your offspring like the grass of the earth, and you shall come to the grave at full age, and the sheaf of grain ripens in its season. So turn back to God. That's my advice, is what he says. Behold, this we have searched out. So he says, we've already talked about this. So it's, they think this is an intervention. It is true. Hear it and know for yourself. So you say, hey, we search these things out. This is good counsel. You should know this. Now, what is amazing to me as we get through this is, again, Job doesn't need a counselor here, right? He doesn't need a psychiatrist here um, because the answer is to his problem is in the invisible realm. It's not going to come from, hey, I had this experience, so let's deal with this. Um, God is allowing this to happen, and we need to sort of justify and, and take apart some of this because there are two different types of storms, right? There's, there are storms of correction, absolutely, where God sends a storm. I mean, Jonah, right? God sends a big fish to swallow you up, to barf you out where you're supposed to be at the very beginning, absolutely. Absolutely. There are also storms of perfection. Jesus will say to his disciples, hey, I'm going to go pray. I will see you on the other side. Go to the other side. And the disciples are striving and they're trying. They're in the storm because they are what, church? Obedient to what God has put them to. But God wants to show them. He wants to give them a revelation. Jesus walks upon the water. There's this great revelation of him. John says, who is this man? Now, Eliphaz here um, and it should be a warning to you and I again. We should be warning those who are in a season of rebellion or sin in their life. Absolutely. And that's not what I'm saying, that, that we shouldn't say those sort of things. But when you and I try to diagnose an issue by observation without some sort of inspiration from the Holy Spirit, super dangerous. And if you've been on the other side of that, and I'll tell you from experience, it stinks when something happens to you. I was sick for six, seven years. I mean, just chronically sick and well-meaning brothers and sisters coming up to me saying, are you sure you have no unconfessed sin? I was like, I don't, I don't think so. I'm too tired to sin. Like, I don't have the, the strength to sin. Well, you probably have something. And man, that is hard to deal with. And we, we have that, again, laying that trip. That's what these guys are doing. What Job needed, it was a good listener. You know, the best counselor, I'm, I'm convinced, is a good listener. And so um, he, they're not speaking to his brokenness at all. Um, you know, what they should have done was just did what they did at the very beginning, keep their mouth silent, um, you know, shut their mouths. But they're putting people in two categories. Those that are blessed because God is blessing them because they're doing well. Those that are being cursed are going through hardships because things are bad because God is cursing them. Now, chapter 6 is, oh yeah, we're going to do this, is Job's first response to Eliphaz. So chapter 6, um, you know, he appeals to his friend. Chapter 7, he's going to appeal to the Lord. It says, then Job answered and said, oh, that my grief were fully weighed and my calamity laid laid with it on the scale. So he says, my grief outweighs my complaint. We'd say, man, you have no idea the weight of what I'm dealing with right now. You have no idea. For 
then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea, you know, wet sand, how heavy that. Therefore, my words have been rash. The word itself, literally, rash there means sucked down or swallowed up. Um, he's saying, man, I'm, I'm having, it. The, the little translation of it is gulp down. He's saying, I'm having a hard time gulping down even what's going on here. I can barely swallow, you know, it's just too hard to swallow, too heavy. And these guys are coming and they're passing judgment on him. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison and the terrors of God are arrayed against me. So, um, you know, this is what's going on inside me that you guys can't see. Does a wild donkey bray when it has grass or does the ox low over its fodder? Um, <clears throat> there is, he says, my complaint is not without cause, right? Just like an animal would tell you when it has no food. I'm not just doing this because this is fun for me or because I'm a, being a baby about it. There is some reality here. I'm starving for something here. Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Or is it their taste of, of the white egg, the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. They are loathsome food to me. Again, he says, hey, this is hard to swallow. I can't even get this down. It leaves this awful taste in my mouth. Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for. What, what was that before? Remember? Death. Now, again, he's not saying I'm going to kill myself, but he says that's what I'm praying for, though. I'm praying that God would just get this over with, that it would please God to crush me. And that's how, remember he had said before, hey, God crushes the people that he's against. Job's 10 kids were just crushed in the house. He says, I would prefer, and you can hear that, right? Any parent would say that. I would take this sickness from you if I could. And I just, I just don't even want this anymore. And I, I would gladly be crushed that he would loose his hand and cut me off. Um, I just wish that God would let me go. And we hear that sort of thing from Paul and Silas. Again, they despair unto death. Um, you know, Job is saying the same thing. He's not saying I'm going to take my life, but he says, man, I just wish God, kind of like a kite, just let me go, right? Let, let me cut the string and let me sail. Then I would have comfort, though in anguish I would exult. He would not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. He says, I'm not trying to hide anything from God. I've been very open with him and what I'm dealing with. What strength do I have that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? Is there strength in the strength of stones or the f flesh in my flesh, bronze. Um, he says, hey, guys, I, I know what I'm made of. I know the reality. This is not my strength. Is not my help within me. And you'll, know, you'll notice that the is there is italicized. It means it's not there. They're trying to give us a, a clear picture. He says, is my help not within me and success driven from me? Um, is the idea is my help is not in me. I know there's no strength. And the word success there is wisdom, the success of knowing. He says, there's no strength in me, and I have no idea why this is going on. But again, you guys are not helping me in this. Now, verse 14 um, begins this challenge to his own friends. He says, to whom who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend. So what does Job say? You guys stink at encouragement. If somebody, if I was in your shoes and somebody was hurting, you should come to them and you should encourage them. You guys stink at that. Even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. He almost says, like, have you guys ever heard that song, you know, um, I get by with a little help from my friends because you're not, <laughs> you're not helping me at all. And even if I was in sin, the way that you're doing this is not comforting to me. You're not making this so I can, you know, there's no fear in you guys at the same time of, of God. My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook and the streams of the brooks that pass away, which are dark because of the ice into which the snow vanishes. And when it is warm, they cease to flow. And when it is hot, they vanish from this place. He's talking about the wadis. The wadis are, you know, we would say desert brooks or desert streams. You can see them, but they don't last very long. Or he says, like when snow begins to melt on dry ground and it's gone instantly. Or when you think the ice, again, we were, we were just in, um, in Whitefish. 
and the kids are walking out on the ice. That always makes me super anxious. And I and they're like, oh, it's two inches. I don't care if it's two centimeters. It still makes me anxious to walk out on ice, right? I've seen I've seen way too. I've seen um, it's a wonderful life. I know what happens. Okay, so. But the thing is, I was talking talking to the boys. Don't walk on. Don't walk on this. Then this ice that looks like it's really thick, and suddenly you get this one spot, and it it breaks away. Right? That's what he's saying. It, the ice is so thin, it's going to break away. There's no real water here in the desert. The paths of their way turn aside, and they go nowhere and perish. So you guys are like streams that are dried up. There's no satisfaction at all. The caravans of Tema look, and again, Eliphaz was, was a Temanite, and the travelers of Sheba hope for them, and they are disappointed because they were confident, and they come, and they are confused. Hey, you guys are a bunch of dry riverbeds. People are coming looking for sustenance and refreshment, and you're given zero. For now, you are nothing. You see terror and are afraid. Um, you know, you guys see what's going on in my life, and you're afraid. Now, he, here's what he said. He kind of calls him out here. He says, you guys know who I am, and you guys are giving me this advice. And whether this is by the Holy Spirit, but we see some of this dialogue back and forth, we sort of see it, that, that it must be true here because there must be some truth to it because they begin to answer back to it. He says, you're just saying this because you know I'm righteous and I have a good relationship with God, and if this is happening to me, there must be something that is wrong with my life because why would God permit this to happen to somebody that knows him? Because then you're a lost cause. Right? There must be something that's going on. There must be something in the, in the realm of this. You guys are just scared. Did I ever say, bring something to me or offer a bribe from me from your wealth or deliver me from the enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of the oppressors? Teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I have erred. Um. He's going to say, hey, guys, did I ever ask for your help, right? This is awkward, all right? I mean, we're reading this. We're going through this. This is really awkward here because I'm sure for Eliphaz this isn't easy, right? They're like, it's been quiet. Job starts talking, and, like, and the other guys are like, say it. We talked about it. Hey, you're the older one. Talk to him. Job, we've been talking this over. I don't know how to say it. It's your fault. Job says, are you kidding me? <laughs> that's, what, that's your advice to me right now. After seven days of being here with me is this is all your fault? Like not, there's, there's no kindness in, in what you're saying at all. And again, he says, verse 24, teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand where and I have erred. He says, okay, mentor me then. If you guys know so much more than, than mentor me, I really do want to understand how forceful are right words but what does your arguing prove? Do you indeed intend to provoke or to, do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of the desperate one, which are as wind? It's actually really funny what he says. Um, he says, you guys are a bunch of windbags, is what he says. Okay, if you guys want to mentor me, but you're just a bunch of hot air. Like, <laughs> really hard for me to hear what you're saying. Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless and you undermine your friend. Now, therefore, be pleased to look at me, for I would rather, I would never lie to your face. He says, hey, guys, look at me, look into my eyes. Right, and this is sort of one of those calling them on the carpet moments. It, it, it is really like if you ever have, if you've had kids and they tell you a story, I remember, um, when um, we potty trained three kids pretty well and then we got to the fourth one and it was just like why like what did we do to deserve this and so it was like you gotta get a hold of us and we're when we're there i'm gonna keep this story pg don't worry and uh you know just we want to be there we want to help you but we want you to get over this because i don't want to be doing this when you're a grown man okay and uh and i remember zephyr goes to the bathroom for the first time by himself and he flushes the toilet come back and i was like uh, one or two. He goes, two. And I said, uh, who helped you? He goes, a ghost. <laughs> and I said, who cleaned you up? And he says, it was a ghost. He was in the bathroom with me. Okay, look me in the eye. Okay, and again, you have that moment where you say, 
here's the thing. You'll probably live till tomorrow if you tell me the truth right now at this point, okay? After this point, there's no guarantees, right? So tell me what happened. A ghost cleaned me. Okay, let's go see how good a job the ghost did then. Let's go. <laughs> Again, that's kind of the moment. Job says, hey, look at my eyes. You, you know, you can tell if I'm lying. All right, am I stuttering? Am I stammering? Look into my eyes. Yield now. Let there be no injustice. Yes, concede my righteousness still stands. Is there injustice in my tongue? Cannot my taste concern the unsavory? Hey, you guys know, just listen and stop. All right, you guys got seven minutes left in you? We can get through this, right? Okay. Job sort of continues on now. Imagine, he says, is there not a time of hard service for a man on earth? Is there not a day like the days of a hired man, like a servant who earnestly desires the shade, like a hired man who earnestly desires for his wages? I have been allotted months of futility and the weary Wearisome nights I have been appointed to me. When I lay down, I say, when shall I arise? And the night will be ended. For I have had my fill of tossing till dawn. So he says, you guys cannot imagine the pain I have been in. My flesh is caked with worms. So we would probably call that maggots and dust. And my skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. So he says, I've got maggots on my skin. I've got boils from top to bottom. I've got ashes. My skin is cracked, and it's breaking out afresh. What he's saying is they're oo they're, it's oozing everywhere, right? He says, so I'm having a real hard time taking your guys' <laughs> advice right now. This is why, you know, it's comical to me that Bildad is going to start in right after this. You know, he's going to be like, actually, I got some advice for you af after this whole dissertation. He says, my days are swifter than a weaver's uh, shuttle and are spent without hope. In the same way that a weaver sort of goes over and over and over on a loom, he says, that's what every day is like to me. It's the same thing over and over and over and over again. Now, verse 7 sort of seems that Job's turning his attention from Eliphaz here to the Lord. And he says, oh, remember that my life is a breath and my eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will see me no more. While your eyes are upon me, I shall no longer be. As a cloud disappears and vanishes away, so shall he go down to the grave that does not come up. So he says, you know, he says, I want to go down to the dumps, which again, he's already in the dumps physically. He says, I just want to be done with this. And he shall never return to his house, nor shall his place be known to him anymore. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth, and I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will not complain in the bitterness of my soul. Now, remember, um, we're told that Job had not spoken foolishly before the Lord before. More and more, um, as his complaints begin, he's going to say this. Okay, Lord, I'm not going to speak foolishly, but cut me a break here. And you've probably been there, right? I know I've been there. Lord, I know you have... I know you're sovereign. I know you have a plan. Please just cut me a break. Give me a little bit of slack here. We, I, you have, I, I can't do this. They only have two categories, his friends here. They're trying to straighten him out. Eliphaz, again, is going to be speaking foolishly. Again, chapter 42, the Lord's going to say, hey, go to Job. Job's going to show you how to do this correctly. Because this, again, what God is going to say is you have a, you have a, a wrong... Um, revelation of who I am and an explanation of who I am. And, you know, uh, I mean, basically what God says is what you said was really dumb. That's not who I am at all. And this is evolving, not just explanation, but revelation. He says, I am a sea and a sea serpent that you set guard over me. So like some sea creature that you're keeping an eye out for, right? I remember years ago when I was younger, they used to have this wharf out at the lake, and it was this floating sort of dock wharf thing. And um, the biggest thing was always, like, there was a story that, like, four or five kids had been, you know, brought under by some monster, and they never came back and stuff. And and uh, I remember telling my brother, like, one time he was underneath there. I was like, you ever go underneath there, it will take you. You will never come back. And as a good 
big brother one time he tried going under and I grabbed his leg and there was pee in the water but we were in the lake so it didn't matter but anyway I was not a Christian guy so he says that that sort of scariness is what he's saying when I say my bed will comfort me my couch will ease my complaint then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body says this whole thing envelops me even when I'm thinking I think oh, if I could just get some rest then I just have nightmares about it and it's strangling me I loathe my life I would not live for that I would not live forever let me alone for my days are but a breath so he says again wonderful lessons we kind of walk through some of this um you know, in, in response to God's sort of glory, he's not answering it. God is not going to answer the why, but the who. God is going to speak some wonderful things to, to Job. Um, and when Job finally sees God's glory, his mouth becomes closed. But he has to sort of get to that point. Um, you and I cannot be pagan people into those two certain situations, right? That if you're doing well, God is going to bless. If things are not going well, then God is obviously cursing you. There must be some sort of hidden sin. He says, man, um, that's not how God works. God, I know that's not how you work. You know, you're not making a list and checking it twice, right? That's Santa, right? You're not looking to put me six feet under because that's the Godfather. I, he says, but death really seems good right now. I really would love if you would just cut me a break. And again, throughout this whole book, he has no idea behind the scenes what's going on. Because this is real for him, right? Out of all the stuff he's gone through, I always think the thing that would be the hardest is the fact that to lose 10 kids in one day. I, mean, I can deal with sickness. I can deal with arguing with my wife. I mean, I wouldn't love any of this. I could deal with having nothing. But to see 10 of my kids gone in one day would just, it would devastate me. So there's probably some of that too. Like, I would just, just want this over with. I don't want to go throughout this. What is a man that you should exalt him and that you should set your heart on him and that you should visit him every morning and test him in every moment? David would say the same thing in, in Psalm 8. Again, what is man that you would do this? Um, how long will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my saliva? It's a Arabic idiom like, hey, can you just make this an instant? Can you just get this over with? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, a watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. Now remember it says, we're told earlier that he had been blameless not sinless but he had been blameless in the fact that he was offering these offerings and sacrifices he understood atonement he says lord if i've sinned i've, I've tried to offer atonement for that um, take away my iniquity again dealing with that um oh, we have two minutes there's no way i would love to get to chapter three because um as i hate ending on an unhappy place here um but chapter chapter eight um, he starts that sort of second argument with Bildad, and then he's going to go to Zophar in this conversation, and then he's going to start round, round two again. Read ahead, and, and here's the thing. I would stay, I would say, um, you know, as, again, I would like to stay in, in going through these arguments as, as one piece, um, because eventually he's going to see God's glory, and it's going to start to make sense. As you and I read ahead, um, some lessons for us. The best counselor is a good listener, Okay. Better to cry and point people towards the Lord than try to explain to them exactly what's going on, right? You make a lousy Holy Spirit, I make a lousy Holy Spirit. Second part of that is some of the theological arguments and words that can come from uh, a heart that is amiss because it's not broken for the things somebody is going through. Be very careful to not be judgmental in foolishness. And again, I'm not talking, if somebody's in straight out sin, Right? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't want to know if I should say something. I'm talking about you see something going on and you don't know. The best thing, again, allow God to be able to figure out that circumstance and that issue. Allow him to be able to sit there and cry with people because sometimes that stuff just gets brought up. Remember, don't try to diagram the situation. Um, 
you know, there are storms of correction, but there are also storms of perfection. Um, hear the brokenness. Don't be an Eliphaz. That's what we learned tonight, right? Don't be an Eliphaz. Amen? Okay, let's pray. You guys made it. Awesome. Lord, we thank you again for your word. Uh, thank you again that we could get through this. And uh, I thank you that you're always working behind the scenes. And I know that sometimes it's hard for us uh, going back and forth, understanding your sovereignty and, and how you're working. But I thank you that you always are working, whether we see or perceive it. Um, help us, Lord, for those around us to not be an Eliphaz that says, well, I had this experience one time, so it must be true. And even though everything I'm saying isn't right, I feel like it could be right. Um, help us to point people to the word and, and by your spirit to be able to guide and direct, Lord, but out of a spirit of brokenness and love and care um, that we would stay as those that weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, Lord. And I just thank you again for um, giving us tonight. Lord, thank you for, again, as Job would say, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the same thing that David would say. And just as we continue through Job, Lord, and um, give us continue to give us insight, continue to allow us to be able to make application in our own lives. And we just thank you again. We ask that you be blessed in our lives, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. We did it.